guys. So we're back. We're at chapter 2.3. sky carriage of gunslinger thought and a second later he sees me in the mirror Roland pulled back did not leave but pulled back like a child retreating into the furthest corner of a very long room he was inside the sky carriage he was also inside a man who was not himself inside the prisoner in that first moment when he had been close to the front and it was the only way he could describe it he had been more than inside, he had almost been the man. He felt the man's illness, whatever it was, and sensed that the man was about to retch. Roland understood that if he needed to, he could take control of this man's body. He would suffer his pains, would be ridden by whatever demon ape rode him, but if he needed to, he could. Or he could stay back here unnoticed. When the prisoner's fit of vomiting had passed, the gunslinger leaped forward, this time all the way to the front. He understood very little about this, this strange situation, and to act in a situation one does not understand is to invite the most terrible consequences. But there were two things he needed to know, and he needed to know them so desperately that the the needing outweighed any consequences which might arise was the door he had come through from his own world still there and if it was was this physical self still there collapsed un, un, untenanted 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 okay perhaps dying or already dead without his self self to go on unthinkingly running lungs and heart and nerves even if his body lived it might only continue to do so until night fell then the lobstrosities would come out to ask their questions and look for some for for shore dinner he snapped the head which was for a moment his head around in a fast backward glance the door was still there still behind him it stood open on his own world, its hinges buried in the steel of his particular privy. And yes, there he lay, Roland, the last gunslinger, lying on his side, his bound right hand on his stomach. I'm breathing, Roland thought. I'll have to go back and move me, but there are things to do first. He let go of the prisoner's mind and retreated, watching, waiting to see if the prisoner knew he was there or not. After vomiting, Eddie remained bent over the basin, eyes slightly closed. Blinked there for a second, don't know what it was. Did I look around? He groped for the faucet and ran cool water, eyes still closed. He splashed it all over his cheeks and brow. When it could be avoided no longer, he looked up into the mirror again. His own eyes looked back at him. There were no alien voices in his head, no feelings of being watched. You had a momentary few, Getty, the great sage and eminent junkie advised him. A not uncommon phenomenon in one who is going cold, cool turkey. Eddie glanced at his watch, an hour and a half to do in New York. To New York. The plane was scheduled to land at 4.05 Eastern Standard Time, but it was really going to be high noon showdown time. He went back to his seat. His drink was on the divider. He took two sips, and the stew came back to ask if she could do anything else for him. He opened his mouth to say no, and then there was another one of those odd blank moments. I'd like something to eat, please, the gunslinger said through Eddie's mouth. 
I'll be ho serving a hot snack in. I'm really starving though, the gunslinger said with perfect truthfulness. Anything at all, even a popkin. A popkin? The army woman frowned at him. The gunslinger suddenly looked into the prisoner's mind. A sandwich. The word was distant in the murmur in a conch cell. A sandwich, even, the gun gunslinger said. The woman looked doubtful. Well, I have some tuna fish. That would be fine, the gunslinger said. Though he had never heard of a tutor fish in his life. Beggars could not be choosers. You do to look a like a little pale, though, army woman said. I thought maybe it was air sickness. Pure hunger. She gave him a professional smile. I'll see what I can rustle up. Rustle? The gunslinger thought dazedly. In his own world, to rustle was the same verb meaning to take a woman by force. Never mind. The food would come. He had no idea if he could carry it back through the doorway to the body which needed it so badly, but one thing at a time, one thing at a time. Russell, he thought, and Eddie Dean's head shook as if in disbelief, and the gunslinger retreated again. <coughs> nerves, the great oracle and eminent junkie assured him, just nerves, all part of the cruel turkey experience, little brother. But if nerves was what it was how come it felt this odd sleepiness stealing over him odd because he could have been itchy he did see feeling that urge to squirm and scratch that came before the actual shakes even if he had not been in henry's cruel turkey state there was the fact that he was about to attempt bringing two pounds of coke through u.s customs a felony punishable by not less than 10 years in federal prison and he seemed to suddenly be <clears throat> having blackouts as well. <clears throat> Still, that feeling of sleepiness. He sipped at his drink again, let his eyes slip shut. Why did you black out? I didn't, or she'd be running for all the emergency gear they carry. Blanked out then, it's no good either way. You've never blanked out like that before in your life. You've nodded. Out, yeah, but never blanked out. Something odd about his right hand, too. It seemed to throb vaguely, as if he had pounded it with a hammer. He flexed it without opening his eyes. No ache, no throb, no blue bomb deer's eyes. As for the blank outs, they were just a combination of going cold turkey and a good case of what the great oracle and eminent etc. would no doubt call the smuggler's blues. But I'm going to sleep just the same, he thought. How about that? Henry's face drifted by him like an uh, untethered balloon. Don't worry, Henry was saying. You'll be all right, little brother. You fly down there to Nassau, check in at the Aquinas. There'll be a man come by Friday night, one of the good guys. He'll fix you, leave you enough stuff to take you through the weekend. Sunday night, he brings the coke and you give him the key to the safe deposit box. Monday morning, you do the routine just like Belazar said. This guy will play. He knows how it's supposed to go. Monday noon, you fly out with a, a face as honest as yours. He'll please breeze through customs. We'll be eating steak and sparks before the sun goes down. It's gonna be a breeze little brother nothing but a cool breeze but it had been sort of a warm breeze after all the trouble with him and henry was that they were like charlie brown and lucy only difference was only was once in a while henry would hold onto the football so eddie could kick it not so often but once in a while eddie even though while in one of his heroin dazes that he thought to write Charles Schultz a letter to Mrs. Schultz, he would say. You're missing a bet by always having Lucy pull the football up at the last second. She ought to hold it down there once in a while. Nothing Charlie Brown could ever predict, you understand? Sometimes she, she, she'd maybe hold it down for him to kick three, even four times in a row. Then nothing for a month. Then once, then nothing for three, four days. 
And then, you know, you get the idea that would really fuck the kid up, wouldn't it? Eddie knew it. It would really fuck the kid up. From his experience, he knew it. One of the good guys, Henry had said. But the guy who had showed up had been a shallow skinned thin thing with a British accent and a hairline and a mustache that looked like something out of a 1940s film noir and yellow teeth that all leaned inwards like the teeth of a very old animal trap. You have the keys, senor, he asked, except that in that British public school accent it came out something like what you called you what you called your last year of high school. The key's safe, Eddie said, if that's what you mean, then give it to me. That's not the way it goes. You're supposed to have something to take me through the weekend. Sunday night, you're supposed to bring me something. I give you the key Monday, you go into town and use it to get something else. I don't know what, because that's not my business. Suddenly, there was a small, small flat blue automatic in a shallow, sallow-skinned thing's hand. Why don't you give it to me here, senor? I will save time and effort, and you will save your life. <clears throat> There was a deep steel in Eddie Dean's junkie or no junkie. Henry knew it. More important, Balazar knew it. That was why he had been sent. Most of them thought he had gone because he looked through the bag and back again. He knew it. Henry knew it. Balazar too. But only he and Henry knew he would have gone even if he was as straight as a stake. For Henry, Balazar hadn't got quite that far in his figuring, but fuck Balazar. Why don't you just put that thing away, you little scuzz, Eddie asked. Or do you maybe want Balazar to send someone down here and cut your eyes out of your head with a rusty knife? The shallow thing smiled. The gun was gone like magic. In his place, a small envelope. He handed it to Eddie. Just a little joke, you know, if you say so. I, I see you Sunday night. Turned towards the door. I think you better wait. The silent thing turned back, eyebrows raised. You think I won't go if I want to go? I think if you go and this is bad shit, I'll be gone tomorrow and you'll be in a deep shit. The shallow thing turns sulkily, sat in a room, single easy chair, while Eddie opened the envelope and spilled up the small quantity of brown stuff. It looked evil. He looked at the sallow thing know how it looks. It looks like shit, but that's just a cut. The shallow thing said, it's fine. And he tore the sheet of paper from the notepad and the desk, separated a small amount of the brown powder from the pile, fingered it, rubbed it on the roof of his mouth. A second later, spat into the wastebasket. You want to die, is that it? You got a death wish? That's all there is. The shallow thing looked more sulky than ever. I have a reservation out tomorrow, Eddie said. This was a lie. He didn't believe the sallow thing had the resources to check it. TWA, I did it on my own, just in case of contact having to be a fuck up like you. I don't mind. It would be a relief, actually. I wasn't cut out for this sort of work. The sallow thing <coughs> sat and cogitated. Eddie sat and concentrated on not moving. He felt like moving, felt like slipping and sliding, pipping and bopping, shucking and jiving, scratching his scratches and cracking his crackers. He even felt his eyes wanting to slide back to the pile of brown powder, though he knew it was poison. He had fixed at 10 that morning. The same number of hours had gone by since then. But if he did any of those things, the situation would change. The sallow thing was doing more than cogitating. It was watching and trying to calculate the depth of him. I might be able to find something, he said at last. Why don't you try, Eddie said. But come 11, I turn out the light and put the do not disturb sign on the door. And anybody that knocks after that, I call the desk and say someone's bothering me. Send a security guy. You are a fuck, the sallow thing said in impeccable British accent. No, Eddie said. A fuck is what you expected. I came with my legs crossed. You want to be here before 11 with something that I can use. It doesn't have to be great, just something I can use, or you'll be one dead scuds. <clears throat> okay. 
The shallow thing was back long before 11. It was back by 9.30. Eddie gave, guessed the other stuff had been in his car all along. A little, a little more powder, powder this time. Not white, but at least dull ivory color, which was mildly hopeful. Eddie tasted. It seemed all right. Actually better than all right. Pretty good. He rolled a bit, snorted. Well then, until Sunday, said the sallow thing, briskly, getting to his feet. Wait, Eddie said, as if he were the one with the gun, and in a way, he was. The gun was Balazar. Emilio Balazar was a high-caliber big shot in New York's wonderful world of drugs. Wait, the shallow thing turned around looked at Eddie as if, as if he believed Eddie must be insane. For what? Well, I was actually thinking of you, Eddie said. If I get really sick from what I just put into my body, it's off. If I die, of course it's off. I was just thinking that if I only get a little sick, I might give you another chance, you know? Like that story about how some kid rubs, rubs a lamp and gets three wishes. It will not make you sick. That's China White. If that's China White, Eddie said, I'm Dwight Gooden. Who? Never mind. The shallow thing sat down. Eddie sat by the motel room desk, the little pile of white powder nearby. The deer, the decon, or whatever it had been, had long since gone down the john. On the TV, the Braves were getting shell shacked by the Mets, courtesy of WTBS and their big satellite dish on the Aquinas Hotel's roof. Eddie felt a faint sensation of calm, which seemed to come from the back of his mind, except where it was really coming from he knew from what he had read in the medical journals was from the bunch of living wires at the base of the spine the place where heroin addiction takes place by causing an unnatural thickening of the nerve stem want to take a quick cure he asked henry once break your spine henry your legs stop working and so does your cock but you stopped needing the needle right away. Henry hadn't thought it was funny. In truth, Eddie hadn't thought it was funny either. When the only fast way you could get rid of a monkey on your back was to snap your spinal cord above the bunch of nerves you were dealing with, one heavy monkey. That was no capuchin, no little organ grinder mascot. That was a big mean old baboon. Eddie began to sniffle. Okay, he said at last, it'll do. You can vacate the premises, scoos. The silo thing got up. I have friends, he said. They could come in here and do things to you. You'd beg to tell me where that key is. Not me, champ, Eddie said. Not this kid, and smiled. He didn't know how the smile looked, but it must not have looked all that cheery because the silo thing vacated the premises. Vacated fast. Vacated without looking back. When Eddie Dean was sure he was gone, he cooked, fixed, slept. And he was sleeping now. Gunslinger some, somehow inside this man's mind, a man whose name he still did not know, the loathing the prisoner thought, the sallow thing had not known it, so had never spoken it. Watch this as he had once watched plays at, as a child before the world had moved on, or so he thought he watched, because plays were all he had ever seen. He had, he had ever seen a moving picture he would have thought of that first the things he did not actually see he had been able to pluck from a prisoner's mind because the associations were close it was odd about the name though he knew the name of the prisoner's brother but not the name of the man himself but of course names were secret things full of power and either of those things that mattered was the man's name. Neither of those things mattered was the man's name. One was the weakness of the addiction. The other was a steel buried inside that weakness, like a good gun. 
sinking in quicksand. This man reminded the, the gunslinger achingly of Cuthbert, someone was coming. Prisoner sleeping did not hear. Gunslinger not sleeping did came forward again. Cool. It's going to start heating up. Like and subscribe. Let me know if, if you like this format. Or if you want me to talk less loud or whisper or whatever. And see you in the next one.